Beloved, I invite you when you go home, have a look at the pastor's message. The pastor's message this week gives the ongoing discussion and adds to the debate of whether or not there is such a thing called purgatory. Many of our Catholics are truly devoted in their faith and in their practice. But many of our Catholics, because of where we are in Jamaica, we have many Protestant families and friends. And there are some Roman Catholics who actually engage in Bible study with non-Catholics. Nothing is wrong with that. The problem is, when the issues that surface regarding our Catholic faith become evident, not many Catholics can give an answer. So I do invite you to take the bulletin home, have a look on it. That's not the end-all and be-all of a discussion on purgatory, but at least it's a start for those who need to be reminded. Today we have another statement from the Gospel that causes some Catholics and many Protestants to have problems with what we do. In today's Gospel, Jesus plainly says, Call no man what? Father. Beloved, you can call me anything you want, just don't call me Madame. Now that I've started teaching at the seminary, each time I go, the memories of being a seminarian, they come back. And I will always remember this particular encounter. One summer, when I was doing summer work, a very beautiful and intelligent young lady came and said to me, is it true you're studying to be a priest? Of course, my answer was, well, I am studying as to whether I become a priest. Well, that's up to God. And she said, why don't you Catholics follow the Bible? I said, what do you mean? She said, the Bible plainly states, do not call anyone father. So why do you Roman Catholics keep breaking the law of God and not go according to the teachings that Jesus gives? I looked into her eyes got lost for a moment. <clears throat> and then I said, Lord, guide my tongue. And then I remember it answering cheekily. I said to her, when I see non-Catholics walking around with their right eye plucked out and their right arm chopped off, because remember Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 5, eh? If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, chop it out. When I see that happening, then I will go back and tell my people not to call priests father anymore. I brace myself because I say, boy, here comes a fight. But you know what? She laughed. And you know why she laughed? She understood. Remember I said she was not only incredibly beautiful, but she was also highly intelligent. And so we began a lively and entertaining discussion on how we approach a text. How do we get to the meaning of the text? And how do we use what we know today to interpret a text? When it comes to this particular statement called, No One Father, well, just like the plucking out of the eye or the cutting off of the arm, Jesus is using what we now know and call hyperbole. Meaning, you take something and you exaggerate it to such an extent in order to make a point. Jesus was actually hitting out at the pride and the idolatry that the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders of the time had given themselves to. And so what Jesus does, he uses deliberate language, in this case hyperbole, to say, stop it, stop making yourselves idols. When you put yourself in front of God or think that you are bigger than God, you are leading the people astray. Why can we say that it's hyperbole? Well, go back to scripture. In the book of Genesis, we hear Joseph saying, God made me father to Pharaoh. In the book of Isaiah, we hear God saying, I will make Eliakim a father to the people. In 2 Kings, we hear that Elisha, when he saw his beloved Elijah being taken up to heaven in a chariot, he runs behind him and he cries out, what? My father, my father. 
and he watches Elijah go off to heaven. Later on, the king says, Elisha is now the father of the nation. So we do have, already from the Old Testament, the reality that when Scripture speaks of father, it's not just limiting it to the biological, but it's speaking to a particular relationship, one that is spiritual. Fast forward. In the Acts of the Apostles, we hear Stephen speaking about Father Abraham. We hear Paul saying, my son Timothy. And then Paul says, I am a father to you, each time he was addressing the churches in his letters. And right throughout, we see the apostles, Peter, Paul, John, saying that we are your father and you are our children. So what we have is not a negation of calling someone father. It is recognizing that special bond, that relationship that one has with people who are called to be spiritual leaders. Father, you're being biased, okay? I'm being biased. Did Jesus himself not say, call no man teacher? Because you have one teacher who is the Christ? Fast forward. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, what does Jesus say? Go and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. He himself affirms the title and the role of teacher. And Paul himself affirms this when he says, God has appointed in the church first the apostles, then the prophets, and finally teachers. Therefore, my dear beloved, when you engage your Protestant family and friends and they bring this statement to your attention, I hope you are now more equipped to answer them. Because Jesus at the heart of this saying is, is really telling the community of believers, which is all of us, don't fall into the trap of the scribes and the Pharisees who moved beyond the Ten Commandments and issued 617 decrees and statutes that the poor people could no longer remember, much less even observe. But he also says something even more significant. Any time the leader or the people puts someone in the place of God, be careful, for that is idolatry and that needs to be shunned. What then is a practical implication of this particular catechesis? In the first reading, we hear, you priests. Again, understand scripture. Who were these priests? The Roman Catholic Church wasn't formed yet. These priests were of the tribe of Levi, and they had gone astray, like all human beings tend to do. We are all royal priesthood, beloved. And as I often remind you, every parent is called to be the face of God and to teach what God demands to your children. But when, as Jesus says, the preaching or the teaching doesn't match with the lifestyle, you will have problems. Take two real examples. Daddy wakes up and sees his son lying in bed. Daddy says, son, you need to go to church. Why aren't you going to church? And what does the son say? But daddy, you're not going to church either. Sometimes you drop me at Sunday school and you're gone. So how come you're asking me to go to church when you're not going? What is the teaching? What is the example? Second example. Mommy overhears her daughter bad-talking her fellow students and using colorful language that really shouldn't be used at that age. And Mommy says, my dear daughter, why are you speaking in that way? Young ladies shouldn't be doing that. And what does the daughter say? Mommy, you're correcting me? And I hear how you bad talk to people in your life over and over, especially the people who go to church. Whether we know it or not, beloved, our children are observing. And they're not just listening to the teaching, they're observing parents. If you're trying to teach me something which is good, it must be done. Faith comes from hearing the word, therefore the word has to be preached and taught. 
but people are also looking for authentic lifestyles. And therefore, the more parents, the more believers try to align ourselves to the Word of God, the more Christianity will make an impact and a difference in our world. What then is the spiritual implication? I go back to what I always tell you. You and I, we are not perfect people. You and I do not have the moral authority to judge anyone. You and I should never ever think that we are better than someone. The way the Pharisee thinking he was better when he saw the tax collector and he in prayer says, I thank you Lord, I'm not like him. Jesus says that Pharisee was merely praying to himself, not to God. For what is the spiritual implication? Those who are honest will know that we try to listen. We try to teach it, we try to preach it, but we all fall short of the glory of God. And therefore, when we know what the word is, and we measure ourselves against it, when we are obeying and subscribing to the word, we say, thank you, Lord, help me to persevere. But when we know we fail and we fall, what should we do? Be kind to ourselves. Be patient with ourselves. Be merciful to ourselves. For when we habitually practice patience and kindness and mercy, first and foremost with self, hopefully we will have the courage to be just as kind and patient and merciful and compassionate with others. Beloved, we are not in a race to get to heaven first. We are called to be companions on a journey. We are called to be a people, children of God, who are called to inspire each other to walk in the ways of God. And when we see a brother or a sister falling, we should not shun the person or people. Ours is the task of extending a hand and say, listen, you fell, take my hand. Let's do this. Get up. Let's walk together. And we do that with the hope of knowing that when we do fall, you and I fall, hopefully somebody else will have the courage not to shun us, but to say, here's my hand. Come, we can do this. Let us walk in the ways of the Lord, because his word, they are spirit and they are life. If we humble ourselves, beloved, and recognize that we cannot save ourselves, nor can we faithfully and fully identify with keeping every single aspect of the word, then when we look on others, it should be with eyes of mercy and forgiveness and compassion. That is how we reveal the face of Christ, our crucified Lord, to others. And when we do this, it is then we prove ourselves children in whom our Heavenly Father is well pleased. To him, beloved, be glory and praise forever and ever.